Greg Hunt next from William & Mary. Uh, Greg is an interdisciplinary researcher that helps advance science with statistical and data analytic tools. He's a trained statistician, mathematician, and computer scientist, and currently works on a diverse set of problems in engineering, physics, and microbiology. Take Thanks. it away. So, um, start my timer here. I got exactly 22 minutes. Uh, let's this thing out. Is it gonna advance for me? All right, clicking on it. There we go. Okay, so hopefully this talk can be pretty straightforward. We'll have a lot of good talks today. Um, a lot of details. Hopefully this will be a little bit of relaxation at 3.45. Their brains need a little bit of a, um, <clears throat> relaxing here. Um, so I'm going to be talking about just a nice little analysis um, that me and some collaborators did um, on looking at some surrogate modeling strategies um, and how, how they regularize complexity and how they fit in different situations. Hopefully we'll hit a, a application to a high-speed flow at the end. Um, that's me. I didn't write my collaborators. You can see how good I am here. This is done also with Robin Hunt um, in hypersonic air breathing at uh, Langley and Chris Marley, who was in vehicle analysis, and now he's at Virgin Galactic. Um, so the other one did the bus with me. Okay, so real quick, one slide, what's surrogate modeling? And we've seen a lot of this, which is great, so I don't necessarily have to do so much work here. Surrogate modeling basically recognizes that often we want to run computational models that are quite resource intensive to run, right? And I might want to run these things a lot of time. Maybe I want to do some sensitivity analysis, some uncertainty quantification, um, some optimization. But if the computational models are really expensive to run, then I can't run them a lot of times. And so what we do, um, if I have, say, my computational model eta has an input x, x might be multidimensional, I'll put some y. You pretend that this is an actual you know, experiment, and we do kind of ex computer experiment where I'm going to sample some inputs, inputs, some x sub s. Um, I'm going to run my computational model eta at those, get my output y, the y s, and I'm going to use those to build some fast approximation, we call it eta hat. Okay? And basically, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to use eta hat in the place of eta. Um, and this is done all over the place. There's been a ton of talks today already on this, which is great. Um, you know, optimization, I want to optimize eta. Well, I can optimize eta hat. If I want to do some UQ on eta, I can replace it with eta hat. And the hope is that if eta hat is a good estimate of eta, then we approximately do these things well in a feasible manner that we can actually compute. Okay. So I think so far what I've seen in this conference, I think I'm correct in saying there are many popular methods of doing this. Basically, take your favorite statistical machine learning approach to do this. Something I've seen here a lot is two archetypical methods we're going to kind of head and head look at here, um, which is polynomial chaos or PC and Gaussian process regression or GPR. So these are very popular methods. There are others. And um, we're just kind of trying to look at some, you know, what are the kind of trade-offs of using these different methods and what, you know, what's some practical advice for using these. Um, so I'm going to do a real quick one slide summary of these two methods. So hopefully I can annoy everyone by doing way too general of an overview of these things. So here's my overview of polynomial chaos. It is polynomial regression with a twist. Okay. So what a PC method does is it's going to build my approximation eight and a half as a linear combination of polynomials. Those are by size. And they're going to be weighted with some weights. We'll sum them up. And we're going to learn those weights from the data. Okay? That's a polynomial regression model. The twist with polynomial chaos is that if I choose the psi i in a really cute way, then in a certain way, I can, I can get closed form estimates of some uncertainty, some kind of moment-based measures of uncertainty. So in particular, if I choose the psi i, so the so-called orthonormal with respect to a certain probability um, measure, a certain probability distribution f, um, then if I Assume I have some x that follows that distribution, and I want to propagate that x through eta hat, we'll call that y hat, I get the mean or the variance of, of that y hat um, from the fit coefficients of my polynomial chaos. So for example, the mean is simply the first coefficient, the variance is the sum of the squares of the others. Okay? Now, there's a kind of a, a basically a polynomial regression model to a million ways to fit this. Um, one simple way you, want to, you can fit a regression is just using something like ordinary least squares, right? I sample some input points, I have some outputs, and I use to get my W hats, my estimates, my weights by, you know, an OLS, typical regression-like uh, approach. And one thing with polynomial chaos is we have to regularize um, our fitting in some way, right? There's no real metric telling us how many polynomials I include. I can include more or less however many I want. 
Um, but that's not a good idea, right? If I have too much complexity compared to how much training data I have, I'll overfit. If I have too little, I'm going to leave some performance on the table. So what we try to do is we try to tie the number of training points, which is S here, um, to the number of polynomials I have, which is the capital M. And there are a couple of ways of doing this in, in some engineering literature, something like oversampling, um, which people say is a popular way of doing this. And this is basically saying I want some number of multiple times, um, you know, I want if I have n polynomials, I want two n samples, okay? And, um, but we can also use some other approaches like rate regression or lasso or pick your favorite regularization technique um, to try to regularize. And that's basically to regularize the complexity we have. Okay, in relation to how much data we have. Um, other comments, right? This is a polynomial regression model. So from a purely predictive viewpoint, it doesn't really have much advantage over any other polynomial basis, right? I could pick x, x squared, x cubed, et cetera. You get the exact same predictive accuracy if you fit it in the same way. Yeah, and uh, the second comment is just to keep in mind that these closed form, um, formulas for these moments are, are still approximations. The equal sign here is very misleading, right? We have a hat over a Y. So it's an exact calculation of the approximate quantity, okay? And we'll look at that a little bit later, but they're still based on the surrogate model. So there's still going to be some, um, you know, there's still a, a, um, an estimate of our, our actual truly propagated mean or variance, et cetera. Okay, one slide overview of GPRs. Um, it's been, I've seen a couple of talks on this today. It's been been nice. GPRs, in particular, we're going to look at an RBF kernel GPR. Um, it's a, it's it has a similar kind of form where we're going to form our eta hat as a linear combination of some functions with some weights. Um, in this case, our functions are these k's, which I'll kind of say are basically kernel functions. Um, and in the case of an RBF uh, kernel, which is basically a Gaussian density, um, our surrogate is basically a linear combination of Gaussian density functions in some way. Um, these Gaussian densities have different parameters you can use. I have a width parameter to them. That's delta. I can scale them height-wise for various reasons. And the picture down here at the bottom is a nice little example of a GPR. The, the truth, true function is black. The training points are the black points. Our GPR fit is that red line. And that GPR fit is that, Linda, is that summing up of those of those kind of current RBF kernels at the bottom here. Okay? And so um, one of the things you'll notice is that it's, it's instead of building up a basis using a basis of polynomials, it's building up a basis using a basis of basically RBF functions. It has a couple parameters. Uh, I'm not going to get into how we're going to fit the, the weights, not too hard. Um, but you also have to fit some of the parameters, like how do you scale the, the these, these RBF functions? Um, and uh, you can also smooth them. You don't have to perfectly interpolate, you can smooth them, something like a ridge penalized smoothing. Um, and what makes this Gaussian process regression as opposed to RBF interpolation or some kind of kernel ridge is typically people assume there's some, that the data is generated some, from some Gaussian process and you can fit those parameters using an MLE. So I think that's typically what people mean that they're fitting a GPR. But from a me mechanistic viewpoint, which is often useful to think about, this is kind of the form of it. So one of the big differences between these two methods is the basis they use to build up the functions, right? So PC uses polynomials, GPR uses these RBF functions, these Gaussian densities. And so one uh, feature of that is, well, they're gonna do better in different places. And if I have a local bump of perturbation, a little hole in my data, um, GPRs often can, can adapt to that quite well. So here in this example, I have two data sets. I have my circles. And then I take my circles and I perturb one of them to a triangle by just perturbing it up. And I fit both GPR and pound into chaos through this. And what you can see from the GPR is that it's when I change one point, it locally perturbs around the point I change. Okay? And when I change polynomial regression, it changes at that point, but there are knock-on effects further away. And the reason that there are these knock-on effects is because, well, if I change the, the data one part, it's going to change my polynomial fit. And polynomials expand over the whole space. They go to positive, negative, infinity. Um, they're kind of globally defined. And so it's going to have global or can have global knock-on effects. Okay. <clears throat> So just expectations for where we should expect things to do better and worse, right? So let's run these things head to head on a, a set of kind of synthetic test functions, okay? So I'm going to look at this whole lovely bit of math here and look at, um, in this case, what do we do? Six different um, synthetic test functions. Here we're using a five-dimensional input space. So our, our dimensions is five. If you think that's small, sometimes people use 
you can on a five dimensional space. Also, you could also, if you have higher dimensions, you might do some kind of dimensionality reduction to get down to a five dimensional space. You can imagine fitting these on a, on a, on a dimensionality reduced space too. Um, but we got a couple different types of functions here. Splinsky Tang is a uh, polynomial, it's a fourth degree polynomial. We have a bowl shaped polynomial, which is just a sum of squares. Um, we have Gaussian bumps that looks kind of like a peanut there. We have some sums and products of trig functions, a hyperbolic tangent, just trying to get different flavors of functions. But they're all in five dimensional spaces. This is, these are some two dimensional slices of these things here. How'd they do when you run them against each other here? So here I'm going to look on the y axis as, a, as, a, as an error, it's a median absolute error. On the x axis, I'm changing how many training points I'm feeding to the different methods in my five dimensional space. Um, and I look at these, these six different functions here. Uh, we've run it a, a couple of times using a space filling design in the, the five-dimensional space. So we have some um, quantiles of the, the, the dotted lines kind of the median error over our number of simulations we do. Um, so one thing you can see from this is that uh, you can overfit. And you, can, you have to be very careful because you can, it's easy to overfit, right? Regularization is the thing we do um, for a reason. So for example, if I look at my blue let's just say what methods I compare, right? So if the black is the GPR, I do polynomial chaos with just an OLS fit. I do a lasso penalized polynomial chaos and a rich penalized polynomial chaos. We fit the, we do some cross validation to choose the, 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 the penalization for those. Um, the OLS, just which, which um, is least regularized at the PC fits, right? Has the most potential to overfit. Um, the high potential overfit, we have complex functions. So the, the Gaussian bumps, and this product of trig functions are pretty complicated functions. You have a lot of ability to overfit, so you got to be careful. Um, but you can see that in some, in some of these other ones, this Tablinsky Tang is pretty complicated for your polynomial. Um, not as much overfitting, and certainly if you regularize, yeah, you help um, deal with your overfitting, which is good. Um, some other things to note. So one of the things that we're interested in is I want my error to drop as fast as possible as I increase my samples, right? The reverse, you know, kind of converse of that is, right? I want to have the most accurate method for the least amount of data, right? And so one thing that's interesting is as I increase my, my data, I'm increasing the complexity of my fits. We want these things to go to zero quickly, uh, the quicker the better. And um, so if I look at in the upper left, there's the Blinsky Tang, which is just a fourth degree polynomial. One thing I can see is that actually these, these polynomial chaos methods are doing quite well. Um, they're hitting, um, they're, at least for the, the ridge and, and lasso penalized, their, their, their error dropped pretty quickly um, as, well, relatively quickly as I increase number of samples. You know, these are synthetic, so it's hard to know exactly what a lot of samples means. Um, but, and uh, that's not maybe the most surprising thing. This is a polynomial function. We're fitting polynomials to it. So I would hope that, yeah, polynomial chaos should be the best. So that's a nice story until you get to the bowl shape function, which is sum of squares. And now we have the same setup for polynomial chaos approaches that are being beat out by GPR. So that's a little bit more surprising. You know, the bowl shape, this, the sum of squares, is a pretty simple function. Um, and um, there are a million ways to try and regularize these polynomial chaos approaches. It's not the only way to do it. Um, is one way of doing it, but it's surprising to me that you can actually beat that. And so what's happening here is that we're ratcheting up complexity. Uh, the GPR in this case seems to ratchet up complexity in a, in a more smooth way that's that's decreasing error quick, quicker than the polynomials, even when we're fitting to a truly underlying polynomial function. We go to the Gaussian bumps. These are Gaussian bumps. We should be we should be do well with GPR. We should do worse with non GPR. Right, GPR is sum of bumps, right? So okay, and GPR as well. Um, GPR as well, and the product, the trade product, which is not got a very bumpy function. Yeah, so um, not too, too surprising. The sum of the you know, trig sum and the this hyperbolic tangent function are they're not nearly as complicated. Um, they're not truly very bumpy. They're not truly polynomials. They're kind of in between in complexity. Um, and depending on how you regularize, um, you can have kind of equivalent performance here, we see that GPR tends to be doing quite well um, on these in comparison. The, the PC approaches definitely eventually hit it. So if that's your thing, they seem to be doing quite well here. Um, but the GPR seems to be doing, um, to be outperforming it in, this, in these cases, which I, we didn't particularly select to highlight one method or another. 
the other way we can look at so an error here, right? All I'm doing is I'm just I, what I did is we generated the test set that's uniformly just a grid over the entire space, and we just looked at kind of average or median absolute you know, error or something like that, right? The other way we can look at this is what you might want to do with these things is do some uncertainty quantification, right? So what you might want to do is, right? Ideally, I grab some x from whatever distribution that propagated through eta. I get some y. Now I want the mean, the variance of y. Um, we can't do that, so we use eta hat. Um, and I might want the mean and variance of these things. In general, you know, formulas for means and variances are intractable. Even if I knew eta, which I don't, it would be intractable. And I do know some cases eta hat. So we could use something like Monte Carlo. There are other more advanced approaches to do this. Um, so you can use something like Monte Carlo or anything. You can pop the cats if you want. Um, PC also has this nice closed form solution for um, various moment based uh, um, quantities. Uh, so what we do is, and this is just arbitrarily, we're choosing this Gaussian bump function. Um, we look at on the y-axis here, the error of recovering mean on the left two plots and standard deviation variance, whatever you want to think about it, um, on the right over a number of samples again on the x-axis. <clears throat> and we do that using Monte Carlo, which we can use to do for all approaches, um, including uh, in black there, which is the GPR. And uh, we do that also, but then for the polynomial chaos, um, we also look at the coefficient based approach. Yeah. So, a couple notes here. Um, one thing is that, well, the GPR tends to recover the uh, uncertainty information quite well. Maybe not too surprising. If you go up through Gaussian bumps, it was the most accurate overall. Okay. So, when you're recovering uncertainty information, it is also the most accurate. Okay. Um, and if you pick something where uh, polynomial chaos is better overall, you would expect it to be better overall here. What's interesting is if I go within each of these two, I look side to side and look, I compare the coefficient based approach to the Monte Carlo approach here. Um, I don't see much of a difference. Um, in fact, if you overlay them, you really can't tell there's any difference. Now, there are surely cases where there's a difference here. We have a five dimensional case. Maybe you think that's a lot of dimensions, maybe you think a small number of dimensions. Um, I can generate, so we, you, we, I didn't really tell you whether it's just a normal distribution, some stand, you know, standard multivariate normal root we're, we're propagating. I can generate a billion of those in a minute, you know. So if in this case we use 5,000 samples, it takes a couple of milliseconds to generate, propagate them, you get something about as accurate as the coefficient based approach. It's not less accurate. In fact, it's closed form. It, it's the convert, I mean, the MC ones converge to the ones on the left, right? Um, but at least in the regime we're looking at, the error is the error in recovering the un uncertainty information does not appear in this regime to be coming from Monte Carlo versus closed form awesome polynomial chaos uh, equations. It seems to be coming from just what's the accuracy of the circuit overall, which um, maybe is or surprising here. Okay, um, I'll make up some time here. So maybe I'll just end here with a real example. Um, just to kind of tell you, demonstrate that we see this also in reality. I made up some, some like test functions to be very suspicious of everything I show you, right? I just made up these functions. Um, we tried to choose some reasonable ones. So here's a real example of a high speed, um, high speed inlet up on the upper there is a mirrored image of the X43. And uh, I guess it's in the mirror dimension. I'm trying to get flow going left to right, I've been told is the correct way to have flow going. Um, and uh, so what we can model here is you can model the inlet of this thing. This is something that's very uh, of interest when you're, when you're um, uh, building these high speed vehicles. So the inlet, let's see if this works. The inlet is kind of, we're going to think of it as leading edge here um, down to this is the body mounted engine here. So this is kind of where we're defining an inlet. So one kind of very, very simple way is to model this inlet as a, just a series of ramps, okay? Right, and so a series of ramps, and we could have a design parameter that would be the angle for each of these ramps. And uh, my flow comes into my engine, it passes through this inlet into the kind of throat of, of, of uh, the, the inlet there. Um, and uh, one thing we might wanna model is say, uh, my total pressure ratio over this. So what happens is I have some pressure out in my free stream. And as I pass through my inlet, every time I pass over one of these angles, I induce a shock. The shock reduces total pressure. And um, so at when I get to my throat here, I'll have some amount of total pressure 
And so you can take the ratio of the total pressure here to the total pressure in the, in the free stream, and that's you calculate the total pressure ratio. Among other things, that you want that to be high for good propulsive performance. There are a million design parameters. Not the only thing you consider is one thing, right? So um, that's the kind of thing you would want to optimize potentially. Um, so here I have um, just a slice of what this total pressure, it's a number between zero and one, higher is better. Um, we have four, and this example, we have four different angles. Here's just a slice of theta one against theta two. There are constraints on these theta, so um, you have to, uh, again, we can't sum to more than nine. There's some other real constraints on this. Uh, but here's what our kind of our, our slice of this looks like. It's kind of like a little bowl shaped thing, actually. It's, it's um, It looks like you capture with a second order polynomial in some ways, and, and you can actually capture it pretty well. So we um, just, instead of actually trying to do an optimization problem, we just say, okay, can we model this thing? Is a four-dimensional function, right? And uh, so again, we look at our, our methods here and we see something similar to what we saw in the other graphs. It makes me think this is a real thing. This is not just some artifact of me choosing nice functions. Um, you can see when I get to the point where I start including second degree polynomials in my polynomial cast, our error drops for those quite a bit. This thing looks pretty second degree. So they actually start doing quite well here. And um, you can eventually get to a pretty good performance. I mean, you know, depending on... The model we use in this case is a really, really simple model, so I can run it a bunch of times. Um, you probably wouldn't, if you're doing CFD, you're not gonna be able to run it that many times. But um, it seems to be that the GPR is doing quite well. And one of the reasons is that it's regulating, it's becoming the complexity, regularizing the complexity in a more fine-grained way, right? So polynomial chaos, you can have zero, first, second degree fit, third degree fit, or whatever. With GPR, I'm, a, I'm allowed to have something a little more than the second degree. This thing is not truly second degree, right? It's not really a bull. It's kind of like it. And so if I use my GPR, um, not without downsides, but it seems to be uh, doing quite well. Okay, let me just wrap up here. Um, so we looked at kind of one of the main differences is between GPR and PC is kind of how parametric they are. Uh, GPR is a really truly non-parametric thing. You can kind of build on them, I guess, a non-parametric like thing. Um, and they have some different qualities and how, how they are able to kind of regularize their complexity at a correct rate to, to decrease your error correctly. Um, both these methods are going to have some problems in potentially high dimensions, right? So look at the five dimensional case here. Not one dimension, not a thousand dimensions. GPR will definitely have problems in high dimensions. Polynomial chaos also will, right? If I want to generate all secondary polynomials with a thousand variables, that's a lot of polynomials. Um, and so you have to do something for either of these. Um, in this case, it's fair head-to-head -head comparison. They have the exact same input space, and they're just modeling that. Of course, you could you could also think of a five-dimensional case as a dimension reduced higher dimensional space. Um, not maybe the best thing to use for non-smooth inputs. Um, if I throw a bunch of noise in here, that's an interesting question for what's going to happen with that also. PC might actually do well there. GPR is not going to like just pure noise variables. Uh, so I will stop there. All right, maybe one quick question while we're setting up. Yeah. So our already is that what's going on? GPR also is going to say yeah, PCE. Is that more account PCE? I want to be planning a little bit. <laughs> I was just saying, I'm not here to attack PC. I'm just purely trying to understand the advantages of, of, of methods here. So I want to sure. Shoot. I can go back to. Oh, do you uh, need the slides? Yeah, is that possible? Maybe, uh, we, we can talk offline. Yeah, let's yeah. do offline to make up some time. Yeah. Thanks.